So we have Shrikan Balachandra, Global CHRO of Airtel. Can we welcome Shrikan on stage with a big round of applause, please? Thank you, Shrikan. And we have uh, as well joining us Dian Prasad, Director at, uh, and Head of Google People Services at Asia Pacific. Let's welcome Prasad with a big round of applause as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. So thanks, Shrikan and Prasad for joining us for Thank this you. discussion. And what we wanted to do really is to set the context for the breakups. So these 30 minutes we're going to spend together is to reflect about some of those trends that we think are inevitable. And it's time for us to probably think about what those trends really mean to our business and start incorporating that. And we will then move into what is the pace of change that we are ready in our organization and how do we define that pace of change. What do you do when you're already the winner? And we have two organizations represented that in their own space have been leaders. So what do you do and how do you manage internal transition when you are already the winner? And the last piece we will cover is how do you drive into two tracks? And many of the businesses represented here, you have a current business model that you are running and you also have an operating targeted business model that you're driving towards. And probably that means what, what reflection or what does it mean from leadership perspective? What kind of leaders are we going to need? What's the culture that we really need to build? And how do we create and maintain or accelerate agility when we scale? So these were the few ideas we had to share with all of you. Uh, but with the permission of uh, Shrikan and, and Prasad, I'm going to come to you as we go along for questions, because really our time is best used only if it's meaningful to, to all of you. Yeah, sure. So let's start with, uh, with the context of your businesses, and we talked about predicting the future. Right. And I'm going to ask both of you, Srikan, about what are the things that you know, are future, but they're actually future facts, which are the things that you already can predict about the business that you operate, and they really radically change how telecom operates and how Airtel looks at the business. Okay. So I think, uh, thank you, uh, Esther, and... Um, Thanks for this invitation and thanks everyone for getting together. I think th this is one, are you in the list event is something that has always um, been a nice event to be associated with. One is of course you draw a lot of inspiration and energy from the young folks who are on the list. Plus of course it's a great opportunity to rub shoulders with you know colleagues, veterans and you know good friends from buddy friends from school days and so on. So it's a great uh, occasion so thank you once again and uh, I had another um, strong recommendation uh, from a colleague that you know if you're going to be sharing dias with DNP it's going to be your day so you know so <laughs> so my day is made with DNP sitting there once again you know thanks for this opportunity so talking about change and I'll of course come back to the prediction part of it uh, if I can but really the change is about what is the impetus for the change and where is are you going to wait for an external stimulus or is there an internal stimulus, internal impetus for change? And the, when I say the uh, internal um, impetus, where can it come from? Is it just a mandate from the, from the boss or is it a collective view of an unfulfilled vision of the company? And when you acknowledge that you are making progress, you acknowledge that we are only half done or not even half done and where you feel that there is a lot more potential for this team, for this organization. And I think that can become the biggest impetus for change. Yeah. If, you know, if you can have that kind of a culture, that kind of a mindset. You don't necessarily have to wait for an external impetus to come, you know, either from the investors or from the regulator or from competition and so on. And sometimes we also view customers and for, for, for organizations like uh, Google and, and uh, Airtel and for all of us, you know, customers uh, are a big impetus for change. Do we look at customers as external impetus, stimulus or the internal stimulus? And I think certainly from a telecom perspective, it's a way of life and to that extent we, we cannot see customers as external. We have to see them as internal and the, the deeper we are connected with what the customers are really doing, I think our change agenda gets accelerated, it gets clarified and it really takes place, it takes shape um, and, and that's what really happens when, you, when you're talking of change in a large company. 
big challenges in a large company, but I'll wait for DNP to have his opening comments and we'll yeah. sort of Absolutely. have an interest. So we'll come back to you on yeah. the rate of change. Yes, um, Prasad. We, among many uh, quirks in Google, you know, we, we have our own language and uh, the most repeated one is we say plus one. So which really means that I'm in agreement with what something someone else has <laughs> said. So a big plus one to what Srikanth started off with. Um, there are a couple of things that resonated with me which is very similar to what uh, we look at and how we look at things in Google as well. One, um, I think uh, uh, someone that Srikanth referred to as customer, we call them users in our language. Uh, so users are extremely important. A lot of times it's, it's really about what the user would be looking for. Uh, lines of the unfulfilled dream uh, that Srikanth mentioned is this what kind of triggers uh, an idea, or triggers a change. The second one uh, that we look at is, uh, it's an idea, I mean like they say, an idea whose time has come cannot be stopped and we are big on uh, uh, encouraging Googlers to come out with ideas. So it's, it's a democratic process. Anyone can come with an idea. We strongly believe that the next big idea could be from a garage in the valley or one of our cities here in India or any part of the world. And we do encourage our Googlers to come out with ideas and uh, you know, kind of uh, work uh, bottoms up with it. So ideas can be another huge impetus for change. Now, the third one is the desire to make sure that you're contributing to a larger cause. So one of the things that I mentioned, I've, I've been with Google for about 11 and a half years and uh, people ask me all the time about what makes me stick there. And I have three reasons, I wouldn't get into everything, but one of it is that there's a larger purpose that we provide to the Googlers, a larger purpose of uh, creating an impact and making, uh, making lives of our users better. Uh, that, that itself is enough for a continuous pursuit of change. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll love to understand from both your perspectives, uh, while there is that desire for change, whether it's driven by customers, the purpose, uh, the environment, one of the very important probably components is to dis decide what's going to be the optimal rate of change. Because maybe in the past you had the privilege or the opportunity to say, okay, we will pace it. Uh, today, maybe you may not have that opportunity, but if you also go too fast, then you may actually create too much tension in the system. So how, what is the right pace of change? What are the different elements that come into that decision making? And how do you okay. know you've taken the right pace uh, decision? Okay, it's quite a difficult question to uh, put your arms around and, and find the right answer. But I think um, the rate of change is essentially for, especially for consumer oriented companies such as us, such as a telco like Airtel, the rate of change is determined by several factors, but one of the most important and the tilting crucial factor is what the customers are doing. You know, so let's take the case of a simple prepaid customer, uh, you know, who's a mass customer and who goes to the market every third or fourth day and recharges with a 25 rupee cash down the, across the table or a 50 rupee cash and he or she does it six or seven times in a month to create an annual, to create a monthly consumption of let's say 100 or 150 rupees. Yeah. This is what a typical life of a, of a prepaid customer goes about. How long, how significant and how long can the customer take to change the service provider? Can he or she change from Airtel to Vodafone or to Jio? If so, how long does it take for the yeah. customer? Yeah. How long does it take for a customer to stick along with an Airtel but change a service plan? In reality, for prepaid customers, these are and colleagues from my friends, colleagues from my, from the uh, telco sector are here, they'll vouch for it. It actually takes two minutes yeah. for the customer to make a change, throw the Airtel SIM and go in for a Geo SIM or something like that. You know, it's so easy for the customers to do. So that's the severity of the impact of a customer's equation. You may just lose the customer in just one go in just five minutes. And or if you were to talk of a postpaid customer or a corporate customer, Maybe it'll take a week, maybe it'll take a month or at best a quarter. So my submission is if the company, if the organization is not prepared to match that cycle of change that the customer is forcing on you, I think you'll lose the race. Yeah. You know, if you're talking of five minutes, then the company be prepared, prepared for that kind of an onslaught of five minutes 
challenge. If the change is one quarter, if the change is one year, then you have to match that. In fact, you have to better that. You have to be prepared. Now you can say this is madness. This is sheer madness. How can a company prepare for change every minute, every five minutes, or every week, or every quarter? Okay. This is where the first question that you raise really becomes important, Esther, which is how smart and how intelligent are you in anticipating that change? Yeah. If you can anticipate that change, then I think you know, you've got some mitigation there for this madness, out of this madness. And I think that's then, but how is it, how easy or difficult is it to anticipate? We are not astrologers, we are not soothsayers for us to predict what can really happen. But I think of late, that has become a phenomenal organizational capability, yeah. which is a collective view of the future. If your team, if your organization is able to produce a collective view of the future, I'm telling you this is one phenomenal organizational capability that we are recognizing, that we are really leveraging on or failing on if we don't have yeah. and so on. I think yeah. this is reality today. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Srikant. And I'm going to come to all of you for questions just in a minute, so be ready for that. Uh, DNP, just to add on to what Srikant was talking about, plus one, uh, what does that mean when you are really a global leader and you are seen as anyway the most innovative company? Well, and I'm going back to this winner's curse. Like, why should I change when I'm anyway so powerful and so successful and everyone looks up to me, not only my own competitors, but actually every other industry and wants to learn from me. So what is the problem of the winner's curse and how do your own success comes on the way for change and probably listening to those users a lot more deeply? Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's very easy to get complacent and uh, lose sight of uh, what's ahead. So one of the uh, values that we follow in Google is uh, never rest on past laurels. Okay. Uh, what's happened in the past has happened in the past. We appreciate that we are a 19-year-old organization and we realize the amount of disruption that we were able to create with each of our products coming out. And we also acknowledge that uh, it's that one idea that we're speaking about anywhere that could uh, create similar impact for us. So it's really about uh, you know, pushing the envelope continuously, uh, challenging the status quo, and uh, realizing the amazing opportunities that we have. You know, uh, let's, let's look at uh, Google, for example, search. Right? Uh, we have moved from what used to be just search to uh, uh, you know, an assistant, uh, initially driven by mobile first, and now it's AI first. So yeah. there is a journey, uh, even despite being a market yeah. leader. Uh, look at uh, hardware or cloud, you know, it's, it's a huge opportunity out there. We're just scratching the surface with what we're, whatever we're doing. Uh, the next billion users are all in this region. You know, between India, China, and Indonesia, we have the three most populous uh, countries, and they're all here. Uh, so uh, creating products, the first one was released recently. Yeah. This is here in uh, India. Uh, so similarly, there are multiple opportunities that we have in these markets. Yeah. So if we're not challenging ourselves, if we're not open to looking at what's ahead, being complacent with the success is the easiest way to start going down the slippery slope. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you do that, Shrikan and, and Prasad? Uh, because it's, you know, conceptually it means that of course you need to push people, that's right, but when you're doing new things, you will also fail. And people say, you know, you see I told you. We shouldn't be doing this, we shouldn't be doing that. So that success is very addictive. So how do you create that paranoia that actually we do need to change? Uh, I, I don't think you need to make much of an effort in today's competitive yeah. environment <laughs> to, to realize that, yeah. um, that you, know, you still have so much to do and you still have so much um, achieve. not achieved and so on. But it's also a fact that complacence does set in especially in large organizations. But I'm truly, truly amazed looking at the way Google does, for example, or looking at the way Apple does. You know, such large, you know, such a large organization and still at the leading edge of innovation across yeah. the world. Big lessons for us in terms of what really happens in those organizations. And a lot of books have come out, a lot of, 
you know, HPR articles are coming out and the Google and the Apple leaders are themselves talking about it. Finally, I think it's about the culture that yeah. the leaders in those companies have really set. And I think, you know, that's, that really speaks for, you know, what really happens in that, in those companies. And I can talk about my own company, you know, where the chairman, Mr. Sunil Mittal, really sets the climate of uneasiness, the climate of discomfort, the climate of half-fulfilled agenda for such a large company uh, like Airtel yeah. to continue to be in quest of, you know, how much more can we do, how much better can we be, yeah. and so on and so forth. So I think it's ultimately, it's all boiling down to the culture and the tone at the top. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Any example, any particular yeah, just, just, uh, just to example add to it. you want to share? Um, yeah, we, we always create enthusiasm and encourage Googlers to uh, look at what lies ahead of us, which is always going to be uncomfortably exciting. Yeah. It's, it's not going to be an easy journey. So uh, there are going to be challenges. How do, we, how do we as leaders and then how do we help our teams acknowledge those challenges and coach them to work with it and work around it and not get into a victim mode yeah. is going to be very important. Now, I was uh, speaking to one of our engineering leaders recently and something that he said resonated with me, so I'll just share that here. Um, and this again goes back to what you were asking about, Esther, which is how do we scale leadership? Yeah. How do we continuously push? Yeah. So his uh, guidance to the team was, as leaders or as managers, one, pick up a new responsibility. And typically, it should be the toughest that your manager is handling. So ask them for what their biggest challenge is and see if you can solve it for them. Yeah. Two is uh, build a new skill, do something which you've not done before. Three is while you're doing that, shed some uh, skin or a habit uh, that you're stuck with. So when every leader in the organization at every level does, you're naturally forcing the other yeah. person on top yeah. to do something similar. So that's Upscale. probably how we can scale leadership. Wonderful. And that's going to be important to stay ahead of the Wonderful. curve as Thanks. well. Wow. Thanks for sharing that example, very beautiful wow. example. So let me open it up a little bit and, and as I always do, I'll take three, four questions, maybe two, three questions at the same time if you're comfortable. Of course, uh, and yeah. then we'll see how they, so how many questions we have or, okay, we have a hand there, okay. So can, do we have the, the mic, moving mic, okay? So, so you can said you were taking one? all the questions, right? No, no, I'm just <laughs> noting them. So one, two and three, I'll take these three first and then I'll come for a second round. Can we pass the mic please? Go ahead. Yeah, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we spoke about change yeah, sorry, here. Sorry, would you mind, would you introduce oh, yourself? Okay, uh, I'm Divya and I'm uh, heading HR services for Unilever. Hi Divya. In, for Please. India. Yeah, so uh, t while we are speaking about the change, if I were to ask that what's the DNA of the organization which is agile look like? So if there are the, there are those four or five things which uh, we need to articulate and say that this is the DNA of an agile organization. So okay. what would they be in your view? Wonderful. Thank you, Divya. So can you pass the mic? I will have to do probably one or two steps. So can somebody volunteer to pass the mic? You can throw it to Shashir. Now, Shashir, can you throw it this side? Yeah. Oh, it doesn't oh. break and it wow. doesn't hurt. Wow. Alok, can you pass it to Alok as well? Thank Very you. Good. It's like you're touching it like it's like glass or something, no? <laughs> it's a soft toy. You can pass it around. That's so. a new learning. Uh -huh. That's an Yes, hello, go ahead. Mics don't hurt, right? Say so again? This, I said no mics, stone. This mic shouldn't hurt. No, right? no, no. It okay. won't hurt. We've so tested it in office. <laughs> We've fully tested it in office. Yeah, go ahead, Alok. I'm Alok and I lead HR for... Can you uh, keep it a bit closer to... Yes. Okay. So this question, uh, Shrikant, this is for you. So you spoke of uh, taking a collective view of uh, you know, what the future might hold. So it would be interesting to hear if you could maybe deconstruct that a little bit you know, for me and for us, that uh, how does that typically play out? And I know maybe you cannot put a you know, process map to it that, okay, this is how it happens. So maybe it is uh, you know, forums and uh, lots of dialogue, discussions, and saying, okay, this is what we sort of anticipate. And then what meaning we do we really make out of, yeah. uh, you know, what we visualize? So, so a little bit of a, a flavor of that will be sure. very interesting. Thank you. Can you pass it to Pratnia that side? Yeah. You, you can throw it. I promise. We have tested this. I have I to promise. learn the skill of catch. Yeah. Go ahead, Pratnia. All right. Hi, I'm Pratnia Parashar. Uh, I'm part of Three Fish Consulting team. Um, 
Actually, very interesting question, pacing for growth. Um, and my yeah. follow-on question really, and it's open to everyone, is, you know, we talk about complacency setting in, but sometimes I wonder, is it sheer fatigue or is it complacency? How do we know the difference when someone is just feeling fatigued and are we be starting to label that the person is becoming complacent? Is any of your Wonderful. thoughts on that? Thank you. Helpful. Thanks so much. So let's, let's start with uh, Alok's question first about okay. uh, from the future, right. what can you see from there and what can we learn from you? when okay. you're looking at us in the past, but talking right. from the future. Okay. So, very good question, Alok. And I think uh, this is something that we are learning as we go along. I can't claim that, you know, we have had huge, uh, you know, experience on this, but I can share some of the learnings that we are going along. So, in this world of so much change and, you know, rapid change, overnight change, um, one of the important competencies that we are beginning to realize, which is probably missing in our basket of competencies and or if we have some of it, it's working, is the aspect of what we call as sense making. And I think in this information overloaded environment, people actually are, we are subjecting people to a hell of a lot of challenge of, you know, Oh, you still haven't, be, you had that information and yet you, you didn't make use of that. But somewhere between having the information and making use of information, there is something in between which is called making sense out of it. And I think, you know, that's becoming absolutely important for organizations, for leaders and for talent and for, you know, even for college graduates who, who pass out, you know, just imagine the poor kid of 20, 21 years, information overload, how does he or she really make sense? So, as we keep debating inside the company about have we made sense, have we made sense, do you see the patterns and as you were saying connecting the dots, yeah. So, I think that's one competency that we have to keep on reminding ourselves and if we can get better at that, I think we'll be that much more better in anticipating the future. So, I'm going to connect that with Pratnia's question before I come to the uh, DBS DNA. question on DNA of organization. How do we do that at the rate that the energy of one human being and 24 hours permits? Because you spoke about sense making, connecting the dots, that, that is something that probably requires tremendous amount of energy that is very different from what we used to do in business as usual. So, is, is it complacency? Is it uh, fatigue? And if that's the case, then what do we do about it? Okay, I'll probably follow yes. DNP on Sure, Prasad, go ahead. Um, a couple, couple thoughts there, and it's a great question. Um, you know, what we might look at complacency could be, could actually be fatigue. But one, uh, you know, how do you know? You, you need to be intuitively tuned into what, what your employees are uh, doing or feeling. That's, that's going to be important. And then creating an environment where they will have the psychological safety to come and speak about it as well. And then how do you support them, yeah. even if, you know, with their well-being? Um, one, I always believe that well-being, a work-life balance is what one makes it out to be. There is no cookie-cutter approach to it. Yeah. So how do you support everybody with what uh, well-being means to them? And how do, you, uh, how do you create an environment where they're speaking about it uh, and in their psychological safety. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's the only way we can address that yeah. and be realistic about it. And then it's also true that when you are looking at something so exciting, uh, there, is, there is going to be energy that uh, develops organically. Some, as from well. somewhere additional yes. energy comes. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, it's culture, the ability for people to yes. be able to speak up yes. and then building that energy loop. That's right. The organization. Yeah, Srikant. Okay, I just want to build on a yeah. uh, great question, uh, uh, Pragnya. Um, I just want to build on what uh, Prasad just said, which is, I think the, the positive impact of reinforcement. Yeah, so I think um, you have had some early wins. Um, it gives you a lot of energy, which is capable of overcoming the fatigue. And if you have waves of change, not many wins, not much of success, it can really turn into fatigue very soon and it can go into a downward spiral. I think important thing is the, the taste of success, the sweet taste of success and especially the, the positive reinforcing 
impact of early wins. I think that's something where, as leaders, we can definitely focus on that and give a taste of early wins to our people because that can really start generating a wave of positive reinforcing yeah. kind of behaviors. Yeah. Now, where is this success going to come from? It can come from customer acknowledgement, customer ac appreciation, acceptance of the change that you have proposed to the customer. That's the ultimate success. It can be the investors giving a thumbs up, you know, financials going up and the share price is going up and so on. So that can again be um, you know, a big reinforcing behavior. But talking of fatigue and energy, the most important thing will be what the employees feel. And do they really appreciate this change? Do they appreciate the need for this change and do they appreciate the need to do so much of heavy lifting even though it can cause a lot of burden? And for that, you know, so I have what is called as OPE. Yeah, so I have a thing called OPE. If employees can exhibit that much more ownership, employees have a sense of pride in the change and engagement in actually driving the change agenda, I think, you know, that can really give a massive tailwind behind the force of change rather than creating headwinds. So ownership, pride and engagement of employees in the change agenda can make the big difference. Yeah, easily said than done, but I think this is reality. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Yes. If, I, if I can just add yes, to it, please, I of cannot course. agree more on um, uh, the O part, please, and it follow, the P&E yeah. follows. Yeah. Uh, we do that in Google as well. We, we definitely encourage Googlers to uh, feel and act as owners, yeah. and that drives tremendous yeah. change yeah. and tremendous energy that follows yeah. with it. Yeah. Does that kind of answer, do you think, uh, DBS question on the DNA of organization? So what would you add on top of it? So ownership, pride, engagement, w what other important reflections for us to, to think about to build that agility? Uh, there, there are a couple, couple of more things that I'd probably add to it. One, uh, and then this is, uh, this is what we do in uh, Google, uh, mission. Uh, provide everybody a purpose, uh, transparency, and uh, voice. Right? And those those three are definitely uh, attributes yeah. that add to the DNA of a organization. Uh, two or three other things build on the success of the teams. What are the what makes a successful team? And then what's the role of a manager or a leader? Uh, manager being a boss versus manager being a resource uh, drives a huge difference. So in Google, manager is a resource and not a boss. Uh, so those are things that uh, kind of can contribute to the DNA of an agile organization. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Prasad. I Sash. just want to build yeah. on board. Uh, again, good question from Divya, my old alma mater, yes, Unilever. I know, I know that. Okay. So um, <laughs> I think um, the, the important mindset is don't wait for a geo to happen. Don't wait for a Patanjali to happen. You know, so have the, <laughs> have the burning ambition, the burning. Correct you know, need to get better, to do better and to, yeah. you, know, you know, on your, on your quest yeah. for, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, being a better, creating a better tomorrow. I think the, the power of the internal stimulus is far more important. Having said all this, especially on the mobile side, as you face the power of so much, so many changes on the smartphone, on the mobile apps, on the 3G, 4G, 5G, Internet of Things, and of course competition, the changing technologies, etc. There's one big DNA factor that we find missing, and that's one that's one thing that we are constantly in search of, and we want to get better, which is what we call of late as the hacker mentality. If the large companies can get that much more hacker mentality, I think we'll be much prepared for the change, which is you know which is really sweeping everywhere. Wonderful. We Thank call you. it the hacker men mentality. So you have to break things. And uh, yeah. give us one example of what does that mean in, in your context. Okay. So um, in my context, the hacker mentality is if a prepaid customer yeah. um, goes to a shop and, um, and says, I want to, let's say, um, if an Airtel customer goes to a shop and says, I want to actually throw away this SIM and I want to buy another SIM, yeah. the shopkeeper there in some corner of Gurga or in a village must be in a position to make a counter offer to the, yeah. to the customer the then spot. and there on the spot 
stick along with Airtel and here is a new offer from Airtel and the entire offer should be generated in those five seconds. Yeah. Yeah. I am saying for these sort of things to happen, you need hacker mindset and hacker mentality otherwise a large company like Airtel can actually get lost you know, in its own processes yeah. and, and bureaucracy. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Srikant. So we have uh, two minutes, and I want to make sure we cover some more questions. Uh, how many questions we still have? One, two. So I'm going to take these two. Can we have the mic this side, Pratnia? Can you, do you want to take it? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> there are some more risk taking in this room. Come on. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So I will just need to make sure our panelists please just be very brief on your answers because yes. we must finish Correct. on time. Go ahead. Can please. we have the same okay. for the questions also? No. Sorry, my question doesn't <laughs> fit the bill. It yeah. may not be so brief an answer, but uh, the thought that I had yeah. as I was listening can to we, both of you. Can you introduce words. yourself please? I am so yeah. sorry. Okay. I am Vandana from Center for Creative Leadership. Yes, Papna. Yes. Um, so, um, Srikant, as I was listening to you talk about uh, the sense-making process, and if you remember earlier change management, we always used to talk about this over communicate piece, you know, that right. now that one way process of this change management project therefore communicates so much is passe because there's so many changes happening simultaneously. <coughs> so, and, but still the power of that collective sense making is so useful, yeah. such a high leverage for all of us. So the question is to both of you, what are you doing to build these collective sense-making processes? Okay, thank you, Bandana. Thank you. Can we have the mic as well in front? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Preeti from RBS. My question was around more of in this era of change, everybody's talking about change, organizations are going through change. Do you see a risk of the pace of change uh, leading to a destabilization? And is there a risk of doing that? Is there a need for an organization to pause, absorb, imbibe? And how does the organization do that, if yeah. that is important? Wonderful. Thank you, Preeti. Yeah. So, um, Srikan, I'll request you to take Bandana's question about how do you do collective sense making? Okay. And uh, you can take Preeti's question. Right. On sure. So, I think the, the, um, the very aspect of sense making, the process of sense making uh, can be um, let us say can le lead to a lot of confusion uh, and insecurity and so on unless it is orchestrated in a team fashion. Yeah. So I think the mitigation here is the fact that if you can collaborate together and make sense out of it rather than expect one individual to make sense out of it, I think it is a far more secure, safe and probably a much better process. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Rikan. So, Preeti's question on I'll what's the risk of Absolutely. Um, let me leave, uh, leave the room with a thought. Um, it's a very real scenario that can play out. So, how are we, uh, how are we training the organization and people to not just run a 100-meter dash but run a marathon? So, it's not just about pace but also build strength and endurance uh, to last that uh, uh, journey which is evolving and which is kind of continuous. That's, that's the trick. Thank you. Anything to add to that question to each other? Yes? We both? Okay. So, oh, oh, my question to the NPM, <laughs> waiting for this opportunity. Okay. So, as Google does so much on artificial intelligence, what will you leave for the humans in the future? What's for us? What's left for us? <laughs> Just say plus one. Plus one. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> That's something that you should ask Google. <laughs> I should ask Google. Should yeah. ask, oh my God. ask Siri what, what she no, has ask, to say. Ask, ask Google. Ask Google. Ask Google. Wow. Hey, Google. What's left wow. for what, the humans? What's, what's, what are you going to leave for Good. So I think we will have, uh, oh this God. will be the opening uh, session for next year. What, did, what will Google leave for the humans? So start preparing for that. We will want an answer uh, for that session. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, folks. Prasad, and thank thanks you all of much. you. And uh, best of luck for the rest of the day. Thank you so much. Over to you, Nilo.